This podcast is brought to you by AMS Neve. For world-class recordings, it has to be Neve. No question. Learn more at amsneve.com. Hey, it's Larry Crane. Welcome to the Tape Op Podcast. Ocean Way recording began in a garage in Santa Monica, California in 1968 as a place to showcase owner Alan Side's custom monitors. From these humble beginnings, the empire expanded to include partnering with Bill Putnam and acquiring his United Recording Studio in Hollywood and building state-of-the-art recording facilities in Nashville, St. Barth's, and nearby Sherman Oaks. The Ocean Way brand also includes Alan's high-end and excellent sounding monitors, a unique and affordable microphone, excellent UAD plugins, drum samples, and even an iPad iPhone app. Alan is also well known for being a meticulous engineer and producer, having worked with such artists as Phil Collins, Green Day, Eric Clapton, Faith Hill, Beck, Mary J. Blige, Ry Cooter, Joni Mitchell, Frank Sinatra, Ray Charles, John Williams, Michael Jackson, and Frank Zappa. Not long ago, Alan sold Ocean Way Recording in Hollywood, where we met for this interview, and it is now reverted back to the original United Recording name. Enjoy this chat with Alan Sides. This audio recording was not originally tracked with the intent of using for a podcast. It was recorded solely for transcription for our print interview. Please forgive any balance issues, background sounds, or lack of clarity. Enjoy. Well, it's funny. I was doing an album with Faith Hill um, at our studios in Nashville. And we had a big orchestra, fantastic rhythm section. David Campbell had done the arrangements, and we're doing these songs. And Faith is there, and the producers are there, and we're recording stuff. And it's punchy as shit. It sounds yeah. really dynamic, and it's really fun. But then there's this one song that they'd already recorded we were going to overdub orchestra on. So we put yeah. this song up. Faith, we're all sitting there. And we play this thing, and the front sounds okay. But then all of a sudden, the chorus comes, the rest of stuff, and the orchestra is soaring, and the track never left the gate. <laughs> oh, it, just, everything was completely pulverized. And yeah, Faith says to me, yeah. why does it sound like that? Why is there no, why does it have no impact? Why does it sound so small? Yeah, yeah. And I won't comment, but the, but the engineer who had done it was sitting right there. You know, and in Nashville, <laughs> they're really into compressing everything. Yeah. But then you talk to a mixer like Chris Odalji, who's one of the, you know, big, he mixes a lot of country stuff. He says, I don't want that. I'll do what I need to do, but don't give it to me that way because I have nothing left to work with. Right. That happens a lot down the chain now. Mastering engineers say the same thing, you know. They've like, ruined it before I get it. Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to do? The compressors have yeah. killed it. Yeah. And well, what, when did that happen? <laughs> it, well, you Why know, did it well, happen? Like, because, yeah, I mean, like most of the people all I know, they didn't compress the bus ever. Right. They would maybe compress certain individual elements or things like mm-hmm. that, but no. Like when uh, Hugh Padgett was doing all Phil Collins stuff in the police, now that was, com- they didn't use bus compressors per se. No, no. He would compress individual items if it needed it or whatever else. Yeah. But the stuff like I remixed, I was remixing Phil Collins stuff in 5.1 because Phil and I had done a couple of albums. Yeah. And he wanted, um, you know, he also wanted some kind of uncompressed versions, you know, of, of that stuff. Yeah. And, the, and the, I, I had uh, Hugh's original mixes, and they're punchy as hell. They sounded yeah. great. Very good. 30 episode, excellent. Was, yeah. You know, no. Yeah, he's def- a good engineer. Excellent engineer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, he, he almost, you know, he single-handedly, 80s rock of what that sound became. You got it. Hugh has a major part in what that is. Yeah. Yeah, but he did it right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the other thing, too, is you pump the multi-tracks, and it sounds Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was really impressed with his work. Um, with uh, Steve Lilly White on the Peter Gabriel record they did together, yeah. and actually Steve and, was just in yesterday. I was talking yeah. to Steve. Uh, oh yeah, he's such a nice guy. Oh yeah, we what had him in the guy. mag a while back. Always yeah, a treat. he was in last week yeah, working on an album. Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, what is the? I didn't know what the interview. What is the interview about? What did you want to talk about her? About you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and those are some awesome thoughts about the current state of things. But, how did a, a, a young guy making speakers in his, and selling them out of his garage end up? How many studios do you currently own or 
head up. Well, at the peak, at the how peak, does it work right now? Well, at the peak of it, I had a lot of studios. You know, yeah, at the peak, right. I had uh, you know what is now um, was Channel Studios, and it's now uh, East West. Right. So right. I, I had the United and Western studios as one complex. Right. At that point, we had we said one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine rooms there. Then we had Record One, which had two rooms, so right. eleven. And then we had Oceanway Nashville, which has three rooms. Right. And then we have Oceanway St. Bart's in the Caribbean, right. uh, which is one very nice room. Jeez. And that was the you know at the peak. What, what years was what was that? That was all running. I sold off um, the the Western building to a, a billionaire guy. Maybe it's probably been about twelve years ago. Right. I sold that building. Right. Because I wanted to keep my A and B, Bill's original classic rooms, intact, which right. is most important to me. So right. I, I kept all the United stuff. I kept Record One, mm -hmm. and uh, I kept, um, you know, uh, St. Bart's, of course. Yeah. And then Nashville was a pretty fabulous place. Have you been to a studio in Nashville? I've never seen that. I drove by the, I was up for Summer Nam and I took my wife down the road there. Row, yeah. And I said, that's, I'm going to interview that guy. <laughs> it's, is Belmont, is that other Yeah, what we did there is that we built that studio. Yeah. It was, it's, it's, it's three rooms, about 22,000 square feet. It was, it was a wow. 1850s Greystone Church and Rectory building. Right. So pre-Civil War. And we wow. tied the buildings together with glass corridors and we made the big tracking room, which has four huge ISOs with skylights and windows, mm -hmm. you can do an 80-piece orchestra in that room. Yeah. It's a big room. Wow. And then the other room's a very nice, that's another big tracking room, and then it has another room downstairs. So yeah. it's three studios. Man. Then it has like a, on the third floor, has this fantastic roof garden that overlooks all the oh. music row on the backside. Beautiful. <laughs> and nice lounge, a nice studio. Yeah. So what happened there is we ran it, and it was very successful, and then Mike Kerb was one of our good clients, was mm -hmm. about to to do a big donation to Belmont to build a new center. Right. And we were two blocks from the campus. Right. And I said at that time, well, you know, an ideal scenario might be that if you guys purchased Ocean Way Nashville, uh, it would be the perfect combination. No, it, there's never been a commercial studio attached to a university. Not like that. <laughs> My staff stayed in place. Uh, I stayed involved, and there's a licensing agreement between uh, the university and myself uh, to continue the Ocean Way as un it's really unchanged as it was right. when I was there. And so I work wow. there, you know, very regularly, and yeah. my speakers, everything's there. And it still runs as a commercial studio, but uh, it's also the students. Are yeah, yeah. occasionally it's more of a commercial studio, and if there's yeah. if there's dead air time or stuff, you know, the students can use the place. Yeah. Or they'll have, and because the place is so gorgeous, it has a lot of big musical events that are done. Yeah. At our studio there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, well, that's you know, big so enough. It's big, yeah. <laughs> so that's the Nashville thing, yeah. and uh, and then uh, Ocean Way in Hollywood. Right. Uh, were which were my main rooms uh, about a year and a half ago I kind of made the decision because our center right now is manufacturing right we manufacture high-end speakers that we sell all over the world right we do microphones we do sample libraries uh, we're mm -hmm. involved with Bill Putnam in the, in the you know the Ocean Way rooms oh the UAD the UAD plugins those and are such. And we'll talk about those later, yeah. And so, you know, and we still do studios to go for various, you know, for years we did studios for Rick Rubin in houses where we oh, do, right. like, for the Chili Peppers and stuff, where we right. do complete, his studio house in Laurel Canyon, we'd set it up as a complete studio with discrete new consoles. And so you're the guys that would just, just make, a, make a gear list, you want this, bring it in. And make it work, and then we'd acoustically treat right. each room so wow. it sounded good. And uh, you still have sort of We still do that. Doing that, yeah. Yeah, we've done it in Switzerland. We've done it all over the, the world. Do you have like a warehouse or something? We have, we have, a, we have a big warehouse. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, it's not here. <laughs> no, we have a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I still have probably one of the largest mic collections in the world. And yeah. Ox Gear and Fairchild. Despite, uh, despite Blackbird. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and it, you know the thing about Blackbird and um, is that, yeah, he, an indiscriminate amount of merchandise that this guy was just buying everything. But to him also, I don't think, for me, I only collect things that I love the way they sound. I don't right. collect things just because they're rare or esoteric. If they don't right. do something for me sonically, I'm really not interested. Right. And he has a lot of stuff. Oh, it's a lot. <laughs> oh, I've, I've, I've worked there. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? But there's a lot of stuff that I would have no interest in right. as well. Right. You know, that he's spent a fortune on. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but so, you know, I, I guess I'd call it a hobby, you know, in that it's, level. It's different, you know. Well, the music different... business, as we know it, has yeah. changed. Oh, absolutely. I mean, at the time that I was doing it, when I had my garage studio, and I probably did, you know, I mean, I did 30, 40, 50 albums out of the garage. Yeah. I mean, it was ripping. The music business was just yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. But for me, what happened really was 
you know, we, we built the original studio as a demo room for my loudspeakers. Right. I didn't really build it as a, a studio. To, I did build a studio to record music, but that wasn't the premise. The premise was <laughs> that I, I needed impressive sounding material to play on my speakers. Right. I needed stuff that sounded dramatic. You know, and it was very hard. It was just a handful of recordings that sounded like that. Right, And right. so I knew I, I had been doing it, recording at that point for five or six years anyway. Yeah. And so I, since I was maybe, since I was in ninth grade, I was <laughs> recording, going out recording live big bands, back right. rock bands. And my first studio was underneath Pacific Ocean Park Amusement Park. Mm-hmm. And I opened that up in 1968, 68, 69, and 70. Then I started building the garage around 71, and then opened that up around 72. How big was this? I mean, it, you say garage, but... Oh, and I, it was, it was, a, it was a, <laughs> a three and a half car garage with that's beam good. ceilings, and then it had a big... It was a very nice, very nice garage. Oh, that's great. And, and very that nice was garage. out in Santa Monica? That was in Santa Monica yeah. on a street called Ocean Way. Right. <laughs> I finally discovered that. I would, I've never... I was always like, I know it's Ocean Way, but it's on Sunset, so... Couldn't figure not, out what, okay. what the deal is. It's not near the ocean. <laughs> Yeah, and then no. I read, I was reading some stuff last night, and I'm like, oh, that makes more sense. No, it was a very happening yeah. place, but we just, uh, finally the neighbors just reached a point, because we were working, you know, <laughs> we were working into the night. Yeah. And uh, so finally, when Bill Putnam, who and I become close friends, uh, he, Studio B here became available. Right. And I ended up renting that or leasing that from Bill. Oh, that's right, yeah. And then we rebuilt that, and that became our Studio B. And then it wasn't long before I took over Studio A, and then I took over, you know, Studio D, yeah. and then... And you had, this was a period where he was starting to focus on equipment as exactly. well, and then you were... You as were he like, was kind of leaving that, and yeah. he, because also it was his legacy, and he and I had were right in the same, we were sonically and everything, <laughs> we came from the same place. Yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, Bill would come down to my garage, and he just loved my speakers. Right. He thought they were, he, first time he heard it, he was... I think fairly floored, and so we just became great friends on many levels. We did was, live recordings together. Even. What was the impetus to for speakers? Were you looking for something that really gave you the? Uh, you, you know, I, I was a musician, but I always loved great sounding speakers. Yeah. Even building my own bass amps, and then I had all mm-hmm. kinds of various speakers that I built, and I used to buy a tremendous amount of old theater speakers out of theaters. Yeah. Because that time theaters weren't doing too well, and I'd go in and I and I just buy the A2s and the RCA theater speakers and JBL theater speakers and all this old stuff and I started experimenting triumphing and building my own crossovers mm-hmm. and different amplifiers and drivers and combinations and I built up some fairly nice sounding speakers yeah that in fact my speakers in the uh, in the garage were I think pretty shocking sounding yeah for the time <laughs> that no one had ever you know yeah I think people forget that yeah what the options were back then a couple of 604s yeah, yeah. It's right. <laughs> pretty much the option. That was your option. Yeah, there weren't very many yeah. options. And so I was running a triamplified system that went down to, uh, you know, 20 hertz and went out to 25 mm. kilohertz. Right. And wasn't harsh and was big and open and airy sounding. And, and it was, uh, it was you know, the musicians would walk in for a playback and it was, yeah. you know, Harvey Mason and these guys, they come in, they'd listen to the playback and they would just go, it was fun. Yeah, yeah. And for me as an engineer, that was what, that was that was the moment. The funnest part for me was once I'd record <laughs> the track. <laughs> is they walk in for the playback because yeah. I always I, I have a concept that it should never be I don't have any I, I don't think such a thing as a rough mix it should sound like a finished record right. from the time they walk in the door right all the verbs the effects the delays what I'm going to do I have it all prepped up while I'm tracking and right. by the time they walk in I've got the mix pretty much you know where I think it's it's in the range yeah it feels it feels happening well also like you know all those records I did with Rob Cavallo all the alternative rock record stuff he needs to hear it like that so he can make a judgment if he needs a part to fill a hole or if it's not quite giving him the whole spectrum, I need a little part here, a little part there. Exactly. And, and we got used to having it sound like that at all the time. Right. And Bruce Wadeen, when we were doing all the Michael Jackson records, you know, that's always the way it was. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, there was unlimited budgets. Yeah. But when Bruce would be at record one, he'd have both rooms going or in a room here sometimes too. Yeah. And he would have put up a mix, and it might have been a triple 24-track mix. Yeah. All the effects, delays, everything set up. Now that's, and it, and it was, and he, okay, you come in, and they overdub on it. Then he'd go to the other room, and another song had been set up the same way. He'd have them take that song down, put the next one up. Everything's recalled, every note is taken. Oh, so man. every time they walked in, it was a finished record, yeah. and it needed one more percussion overdub or one more thing, or Michael would stand there and say, hey, Alan, Bruce, I hear... I hear this, and he would, in his sing own me. voice, sing, sing the part, yeah. or I need a melody line here, and he would, Michael was extremely 
hands-on on delivering content oh, yeah. of what I know, like. that's what uh, interviewing views produced, that's one of the things he would say. He'd sing you the, he'd tell you. Oh. He'd, he'd hear it in his head, like, sing oh. a part, sing any part. <laughs> oh, and yeah, I mean, it was pretty ridiculous. <laughs> that's something else. And so, yeah, when I, then I saw I built, when I built Record 1A, um, that was really for Michael. Uh, when they started, I think they were doing Dangerous, what they were doing in there. Um, and they wanted some really interesting speakers that would be very fun to listen to and loud, so I built this big system. Yeah. And uh, then they, you know, actually, Quincy sort of moved, when, they, when Philip, when they were doing Thriller, uh, they had started at Westlake, and then they started doing drums and strings and choirs and stuff over at Ocean Way. And once yeah. they came over here, pretty much, they just moved in. Yeah. And then Quincy did Back on the Block at a, oh, yeah. a record one, and then they started, this did all the records from that point on. Yeah. But, um, but so I built this big system and then put in this 100 input console for Bruce. And I think Bruce won, I don't know, maybe three consecutive Grammys for Best Engineering Album of the Year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in, yeah, something like that. In that room of albums that's done good. in those rooms. I'm sorry, yeah. Oh, no, that's good. So, yeah. um, you know, after Michael finished all that stuff, um, Dr. Dre sort of moved in. So we yeah. did uh, 50 Cent, Eminem, all those records were done. At yeah. yeah. And so that A room is Dr. Dre's. He's still... His, oh, yeah, he's there. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So that he basically record one is his home, shall we say. Right. And so... Um, you don't see that much in the industry anymore, you know, where, he, where, you where know, there's that much booking, solid or a solid, you know, blocked out booking. Well, he celebrated, he celebrated his, his billionaire status on TMZ in the living room at Record One. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, Record One has this, it looks like a, uh, I mean, it has two beautiful studios, but it has yeah. big living rooms with fireplaces and full oh, kitchens nice. and office suites. And yeah. it's very, uh, it's more like staying at, at a lovely private home. Yeah, Dre's been there for a while. Yeah. So you're still owner? So I'm still, yeah, I own, I own, I own yeah. I saw, I saw I'm, uh, what happened in, in, in uh, the studios in Hollywood was... Yeah. Um, Sunset Gower Studios. Mm -hmm. uh, they own about 400 million Hollywood real estate. Really, really, really wanted my parcel. Right. Because it sits on the front door of their lot. And I also <laughs> own half the street as well. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm very good friends with, with, with the owners of, of the lot. And mm -hmm. but they really like what that brings. The, the, they like the Ocean Way brings a certain thing to the lot that they value. Oh, sure. Yeah. And so it was a kind of a perfect situation for me where once again, uh, I ended up making a deal where I sold them the assets and we have a licensing agreement to maintain Ocean Way. Right. And they say basically, it's, a, it's an agreement that they pay me so much, whatever, and I, right. and I still involve with it. And uh, it yeah. basically my staff is in place and, and really everything stays the same. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Other than, yeah. from my standpoint, I'm, I'm, I'm cashed out. I mean, at some point you got to think about just retiring to some some degree yeah no i'm working constantly in the studio yeah, so then the, i own i own this building uh, and i own yeah. uh, the building next door where canon film is okay yeah. so then i ended up selling the building uh to sunset gower to put canon film in there right and then this building I actually sold to sunset gower and then my friend ricky minor was about to build a studio over the paramount lot and i said well you ought to take a look at this right he likes being on a film lot yeah. And so he was. He had just finished up the Leno show. Leno was was hitting six months early. Yeah. And he was going to come back to American Idol. Uh, Ricky had done American Idol during the peak when it was immensely successful. And then right. he left to go to Leno. Yeah. Because Leno was so profitable. Sure. And then and, and then he, and I was, he came back. We did this year because we'll cut in uh, on, on that show. We typically come in. I work three fourteen hour days where we'll cut like eleven songs right. in one day. Then we do all the overdubs, and we do all the strings, and we do everything else. And we have three separate vocal setups where they can do vocals simultaneously. So we'll cut the tracks. As soon as we're done with the tracks, we do good, really good rough mixes. We send them over the line to them. And there's three vocal coaches, and they do each one does vocals, and then they send them back here. And then we do the backgrounds. We usually have a room at Ocean Way where we're just doing backgrounds, and room where we're just doing strings. Right. And then, and then we mix it all on Monday, and it's at Master to Bernie's on Tuesday, and it's up on iTunes by noon on oh Tuesday. My God. That's crazy. <laughs> I never thought about this end of the process for that show. Yeah, because we, we do the yeah. finished, what we do is right. we do the finished album version. Right, because they've done a And they do a live, live minute and a half version of the show. Right. But we right. but the arrangement's worked out here. Right. Before totally. that's done, everything's figured out how the arrangement's going to do everything else. Right. The that's tough the, part I, is that, obviously, our versions are pretty slick. Right. And the ref, and some of these guys, are, they're pretty good singers, but not necessarily do they deliver 100% live. Right. Some I do, mean, some don't, you know. They're new. 
Yeah, you know, that's right. You know, so, you know, I, I told someone the other day, I said, you know, if you've been out on the road for two months, these vocal takes would be a lot easier. That's true. You know, like... I'm I mean, sure you've done it. How many times have we done albums where we do the album first? They yeah. go out on the road, and then you go see the show, and it's ten times better than the song we recorded because they fixed, yeah. they figured out what yeah. didn't work. Yeah, and how to, how to just get in, get into the song better, too. Absolutely. Deliver it better. So it's part of the game. <laughs> well, it is part of the game. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so now yeah. um, our main plant, uh, our manufacturing plant is in Burbank, right. where we manufacture all of our loudspeakers and mm-hmm. our warehouse for all of our equipment. And, uh, right. And then I actually live up in Santa Barbara. Right. That's what I was figuring since you're yeah. driving in. But well, it's I, beautiful uh, up there. <laughs> but I, you know, Ricky and I, we just work, you know, constantly. Yeah. We had Stevie Wonder in here last week. We're doing this, 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 this album I did with Dave Cause is all duets. Oh, nice. It's all vocals. It's like I got a lot of great artists on it. That sounds fun. It's a fun record. <laughs> yeah. Many years ago, you kind of started saying which things you'd like to work on as an, as an engineer and such. You, you yeah, you know, didn't the, have to just do everything walking through the door and, and, and fight in the, the 70s somewhere. Well, of course, yeah. And, and I've worked on some projects that were like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. This is as painful as it gets. Yeah, we've all been there. I think. You know, and I, exactly. You know, so we've, I, you know, I can't say I haven't put it. When you say paying your dues, boy, have I paid some dues. Yeah, I say to my son sometimes. I said, if you'd worked the hours that I worked, you know, I worked yeah. two lifetimes. <laughs> you know, yeah, I sleep wasn't an issue. Yeah, right. Yeah, but you know, I've I've I, I have uh, I've worked with some amazing artists. I've had some real high highs musically. Yeah, I imagine. You know, I look through through like your uh, all music or something. It was just it's ridiculous. You and that, that's probably not even a quarter of it. Right, and you, yeah. you know how that is. That it's all yeah. lost somewhere. <laughs> and it was terrible as we as engineers. I mean, I don't think I have 3% of what, I, of what I've recorded. Copies actually, of I actually have album. copies of it. Oh, yeah. I just never I just never had the time to deal with it. And nobody nobody yeah. sends, sends them to you, <laughs> tracks you down. Not to mention gold records and such. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, not, I'm not, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, uh, uh, I mean, like, you know, in, at, at Ocean Waves, probably, you know, you know 250 platinum gold records sitting on walls. Right. You know, and that's probably a tenth yeah. of what sure. that studio did. And oh, yeah. uh, we just didn't, uh, you know, just didn't pursue it all. You have to be chasing them down. <laughs> you do, and sometimes, yeah. like even when we did American Idiot for Green Day, right? Yeah. They never actually had made a record because they couldn't make a decision on how it was going to look. <laughs> <laughs> so Billy Joe and the guys... So there, there was never really a record, uh, a platinum record, and that was that sold 21 million records. Jesus Christ! <laughs> well, so much for that one. <laughs> so much for that one. Oh, that's just crazy. You know, but and I, I just think of all those amazing records we did, and we never took any pictures. Right. Um, we, I mean, we run that all the time, doing like an article, like an interview with you, with someone who's got some history. We'll be like, "Wow, you talked a lot about such and such." No photos. No photos. Yeah. No, I mean, so much it went by. So many yeah. amazing moments. Oh, yeah. So much craziness. But you, you know, <laughs> you're focused on the music, you know. You're not documenting the yeah. visuals. Just, <laughs> you know, we didn't actually start taking pictures until, until some years later. Yeah. Yeah, but, but, you know, during the real peak there when things were just... I mean, we did all that long record with Richie. I think it's all 35 million records. Right. We did, you know, I Always Love You, Whitney Houston. Yeah. That was 20 million yeah. records. <laughs> And uh, even, like, even, but even later, like, I mean, Genius Loves Company, Ray Charles, that mm-hmm. did very, very well. Oh, sure. And, uh, I mean, I think when we figured in excess of a billion albums sold yeah. out of the studios. <laughs> it's crazy. Well, it's funny, because, you know, you think in Hollywood, you know, Ocean Way, we are here since 1958, or the original. Yeah. Uh, in Capitol Studio, uh, they're same thing, 1958. Yeah. They opened almost the same time this place did. Right. But if you look at their overall chronology of albums... You look at our chronology of albums, yeah, and total number sold. It's bigger. No comparison. Yeah, Isn't that crazy. Yeah, this is just a, it's an insane amount of history. You know? Well, this is hilarious. We were doing this Paul McCartney record, and um, Paul, we he he wanted he needed one more room to do strings, and we were all booked up. He was tracking strings, so he booked Capitol to do a string date, right? Yeah. So Paul's laughing. I'm going to go over to Capitol. He says, "Okay, Paul." So he gets in the car, he goes over to Capitol, and the guard. This is after the 9/11 thing, everything else. You know, they'd have really tight security, and the guard wouldn't let him in. <laughs> Paul McCartney, Capitol Records. Okay. And Paul comes back, and he says, they wouldn't let me in. <laughs> that did change after that, but I'm oh sure there God. were some changes in personnel. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But, I mean, it is pretty funny. Whoa. <laughs> and Paul's the nicest guy in the world. You know? Yeah, it sounds like he's... 
his eyebrows probably went up, and he's like, "Oh uh-huh. uh, well, let's see." Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a there was some story. Well, you remember Fletcher from Mercenary? Oh, of course. And there was some story where he called. Paul called him looking for a mic, and he thought someone was pulling his leg. <laughs> he's like, I heard you're the guy who would have this, you know, XX whatever mic. You know, he's like, yeah, right, sure, buddy. You're my Paul McCartney, and hangs up. <laughs> Gets like, a call back, like, no, really. And he's no, like, no, really. And it's a problem. Well, you know, <laughs> it's, what can you say? <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> it's like one time I was walking, I was walking the hallway, uh, down the hallway. It wasn't here, and, and Don Wells was standing there. And I think that Nick and Keith were, were standing there. And I think it was George Harrison and maybe Ringo. Yeah. Because Ringo was doing his record in B. Right. And it's like, oh, hi, this is George and this is Paul. <laughs> this is like, you know, like, oh, my God. Yeah. He gets a little crazy. That's pretty unreal. On a musical, you yeah. know. And we did a couple of Stones records, and I, on one of them, I remember they, I think they went to like a thousand reels of two-inch tape. Oh, my God. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. have like a catalog. It was a know? different. Yeah, they did. You know, it was like endless slaves that go off because each of the members sure. would t- do their own work on different areas and different places. And then it got sent to this person, and that sure. person. They bring it back and they comp it together and take the pieces off. And it was like, oh my god! You know, it was a day of. Three uh, M used to fly me and they used to go in there. These this lovely private jet. They take us out to their their hunting lodge. Out. <laughs> 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 They're happy with all the tape you're buying. It was yeah. yeah. I, I think I was the biggest buyer of three M tape at one point oh in the United god. States. You, you've seen this arc of the, the business there. With, oh my God! I mean, what do you what do you think of that? What do you think of the? Well, you, you, we hear st- all these horror stories of studios closing. Well, here's, well, here's the thing: is if you look at what the studio scene was, you know, yeah. say in the '80s, right? Yeah. Well, in a typical studio, say that the rate for the studio was a really nice studio. The rate was eighteen hundred bucks, two thousand bucks a day for the studio, mm-hmm. right? Well, the rate today is about the same as it was at that, and sometimes it's less, but because we have the kind of rooms we have with the mics we do, we tend to get a little bit better rate because right. you can't get anywhere else. Right. And there's a finite number of places that can do what we do. So yeah. generally, they're more than happy to pay the rate because they're only going to be there for a day or two days of tracking or strings or mixing, whatever they're going to do there. Right. But sometimes we get some long projects that come in. Um, but back then, we would have a waiting list. And you know, the first hold, the second hold, the third hold, sometimes a fifth hold. Kidding. Right. Oh no, and so it wasn't really a question of being booked. It was only a question of of being able to fit everybody in. It's because you'd right. have certain producers that were your best friends and clients, and they would. Well, of course you can get me in. Yeah, <laughs> hope so. It's like getting a table at the front of Spago in the old days in Hollywood. Yeah. You know? If you knew, yeah, yeah. it was uh, it was a, it was a tough to keep all my producers like you know T Bone Burnett and Don was and all these various clients I had. Yeah. Of course, the Lionel Richie Camp, the Michael Jackson Camp, and Quincy Jones, who was our best client. It was just like an endless list of yeah. not to mention the rockers, right? And so um, uh, that way, so but typically a session would be every session was dual twenty four track, right? Okay. So you, you get, it was like 500 bucks a day for the extra machine and 24 track. If they were doing Dolby A or Dolby SR or something, another 250 or 500 bucks a day. And before you know it, the, 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 including the tape or anything else, it was another 2,000 bucks a day plus the 2,000 bucks a day for the, for the studio. So you're paying 4,000 bucks a day. Right. And then it's a 12-hour lockout. But a lot of times they go into overtime. So right. they end up going two, three, four, five, six hours of overtime. And so all, all of a sudden now you're talking... Five six thousand dollar days for each room. Okay, <laughs> and then also if you yeah. look at that period of time, and you look at where the expenses have gone now, uh, but of course the records are making so much money right. that no one was overly concerned. They right. were mainly concerned about getting it done and getting it done right as quickly as possible. Right. And so uh, it was um, it, it was not unreasonable based on on what everybody else was doing. And there was the record companies were, were kicking ass, and so, right. so it, was, right. it was an amazing time. Right. Um, but then what happened was um, all that disappeared Pro Tools came in all the ancillary stuff just went away and the rates started dropping because there was a lot of competition and you know and budgets got much tighter Uh, but the cost of operating went up exponentially right so say my electrical bills here in 1981 were 1800 bucks a month now they're 8000 bucks a month okay right um our insurance, like our workers' comp and stuff back then, was what is it? It was you know, I it, it, it went from from you know eight thousand dollars a year to fifty five thousand yeah. dollars a year. Yeah. And every single expense, uh, all the medical insurance for my employees. At one point, we had a hundred employees. Yeah. I mean, it it just went up. You know, it's it's so so the, so the cost of doing business has quadrupled. 
but the but the actual rate charge is no different than it was in 1981, right. other than there's no ancillaries. Right. And so at a place like Ocean Way, we have huge rooms and important Hollywood real estate, and you have a, a, a fantastic, I had six full-time technicians working mm -hmm. all the time, right. incredibly well-trained seconds, you know, two runners for every room, you know, fantastic secretarial staff. You had a huge staff. Right. And people expected a very high level of service. Right. And they, they get it. And they got it. <laughs> it was like yeah. staying at the Four Seasons. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, everything was immaculate. Everything was perfect. Every microphone was perfect. Yeah. And because Ocean Way specialized on more esoteric stuff, you come into our place and the Fairchilds or the LA2s or the EQP183 Poltex were in perfect condition. Right. Every EMT was tweezed with just the right <laughs> thing. Yeah. You know, the analog machines were aligned flawlessly. And everything, it was a different level of performance. And the engineers were very, very demanding. Right. The producers, and that's what it was. And I'm, I feel... It was an amazing time, but it was it was a very, very demanding. Yeah. Everybody was and now. People are infinitely less demanding because most of you don't even have technicians on staff. Right. You go in there, something breaks. Oh, that's sorry about that. Right. I mean, that's a <laughs> that's a different world. <laughs> but because we still do orchestras yeah. and stuff, right. we still have to have a, a high level of, of, of maintenance. Things have to work. Yeah. When well, orchestral session, we were, we were uh, John Rod and I were talking about that yesterday. Just. You know, he's gone to Abbey Road and, and places to track, you know, mm -hmm. string sessions. And your, your cost is, oh. the amount of people in the room is alone just paying for them. Well, you go to the Sony stage, you know, yeah. it's, it's going to cost you 6000 bucks a day. Oh, yeah. For that room. Yeah. And just all the players. It, it's just, it, it's very, I mean, it's, that's for the room. Forget about yeah. the players, you know. Players in the union. <laughs> well, of course, yeah. I mean, as, as we all know, it's a major issue right now that so much of it is leaving Los Angeles and most of it's being scored because uh, of the current union contracts right. the film companies are just basically not recording here anymore right and so it's it's very unfortunate um, and we're yeah. all hoping that someone can come to an agreement yeah it, even to the point of starting a new union specifically for film where because they're willing to pay I mean they, they, they cost them but they go to England say they have to bring the producers the directors everybody over there right. and it costs a lot of money they're not going to be going coach <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, but the back end still still is significant, right? Because if you do a score here, um, you're going to pay for the score, and then if you release an album, you're going to pay the orchestra a second time, and if you use it right. for TV commercials, you're going to pay it yet again, yeah. and then they're also going to get royalties and thing. So it was a and, and when the movies were making tremendous amounts of money, it was good for everybody, right? Unfortunately, they're not making anything near the money they made back then, yeah. And so they've really started cutting production costs, and so the three main scoring stages are sitting not very busy. It's terrifying. And if they close, and, they, and, they, and, they, and it could happen, if they end up closing, we're over. Right, then you can't. There's no place to go. You can't build a new one from scratch no. all of a sudden. No, It's like right track in New York. You know, It was a beautiful stage. Right. And just couldn't justify yeah. enough income to make it stick around. Yeah. You know, and uh, it was a beautiful place. And of course, Tadio, when Tadio closed up, I right. bought all the equipment from Tadio. I did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. Someone has to. This is the console from Tadio. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the story about you, the gear acquisition. I mean, it starts with like the, or one of the early stories is the Putnam story where you went and bought the old yeah. console and the. All that stuff. $8,000 for a bunch of junk. 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 <laughs> I mean, obviously, you were focused on the speakers and being a musician. Well, you know, and even even at the time, like when Western United was at its peak, and right, yeah. they were updating like everybody else, and right. getting rid of the old stuff and saying, "Well, right. no, people want four fourteens. They don't want C twelves or two fifty ones. Yeah, uh, they want U eighty sevens, not sixty sevens." Yeah. And so, <laughs> I bought all the tube mics yeah. from Western. So oh, you gosh. know, all those mics would have been gone. Yeah, yeah. Like Capital had a lot more tube mics. Right. You know, now they've got they got they got six forty like six U forty eights and they've got some sixty sevens and that's it. Wow. <laughs> they don't. What do you think of that? I mean, the, the rush forward of technology you've had to deal with it in your studios over the years in many different ways, like you know, dash machines and. Well, you and know, I mean, I mean like years ago when I was like, I remember one time, um, uh, I was very good friends with with people at Tadeo in the early mm -hmm. years, and Tadeo used to score their films on the old Chaplin stage, which is now A and M. Mm -hmm. And they had a portable equipment. They bring in all their microphones, all the equipment. They bring it in. They do the recording, and then they would leave. Anyway, all that equipment was just sitting in storage. 
and I ended up buying a bunch of Cine Church mics. I mean, that is, it's a modified U forty seven. Yeah, and Usually I bought black. Yeah, yeah, for film. And they they have a basically it's yeah, it has a, a ace. It has a uh, you know what is it a seventy five ninety one? It's a sixty seventy two tube. Mm-hmm. It's a little more like a two fifty one electronically, yeah. but it's impervious to overload. Yeah, it's a phenomenal microphone. Shockingly good. Right. As, I mean, imagine the best U forty seven you've ever heard, and then add forty percent. Right. It's like I mean, it is just, it is just unbelievable. And I had I bought uh, eight of those from Tadio. Right. When I was uh, in 1968. Right. And then I bought I had 67s. I had those. I had uh, Telefunk and CM 61s. I had Telefunk and Cardi. I'm sorry, which is basically a Sheps. And then yeah. I had Sheps um, M221 cardioids, and uh, I had a bunch of great mics. Yeah. And so I had like a little custom console that I built up discreet and I would go and I do live recordings right. and then those are the recordings I would use for demo purposes right for your speakers so you know once you've heard those mics you start comparing those to 87s and 414s and stuff you go well what are you talking about so yeah. that's when I started buying all those mics yeah. from Europe and I bought right. thousands of mics from Europe over and as I was you know from uh, they were all just throwing the stuff out right they wanted they wanted phantom power they wanted <laughs> they didn't want tubes they didn't want any of that stuff I mean, the thing that's really interesting to me in your story is that you're using your ears and oh. trusting your ears. You it's, know? In the end, that's all it is. Right. Can, um, can I say one more thing? You know, some yeah. people on a technical level get too caught up in the process. Mm-hmm. And the process, to some degree, is irrelevant. The only thing that's relevant is the end result. Yeah. Okay? And you may do some unorthodox things to get to this place, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but if you get to that place, yeah. in, 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 in sound, it's all about what's in your head, Right. If you hear a certain thing in your head, then you're going to do whatever you have to do to make that happen. Absolutely. And that's why speakers are always so important to me, because if I can hear well, I can make any judgment. Right. All right. So I need to record something. I need to play it in my car and, and have it punchy as shit and know that it sounds, and I've got the right, right amount of 30 hertz in my kick drum, and I've got right. the air, and nothing's harsh. Right. So I can turn it up, and it doesn't hurt my ears, and it's fun to listen to. Yeah. You know all the things that's that we all think. The stuff I'm thinking about all the time. <laughs> Absolutely. You know. You know. I mean, I just, I think that harshness is a, is a really good uh, thing it, to bring up because it's something that's become more prevalent with digital yes. recording, just and, due to some of the exactly the technology and the ways it works. And you have to work really hard. I mean, that's yeah. the amazing thing. You get certain singers where maybe they also have a lot of ant in their voice, and certainly mm-hmm. getting at the chorus and stuff. Yeah. And with Pro Tools. I'm in love because actually I can go in and maybe there's a harsh syllable or a word right. and I can take a little 5K out, a little 2K, or okay. they turn off the mic and I can add air when, it's, yeah. when they're here. Yeah, yeah. And I, and, I, and I can turn every S down manually until it's the perfect level. Yeah, yeah. Clip gain. Oh, gain. <laughs> God came to us. Clip <laughs> gain. Finally. Oh, yeah. my God. I got so yeah. sick of those little lines. Oh, yeah. You'd just be drawing all this crap, you know. Well, I used to I remember watching, um, you know, Shishnaya's ex-husband, you know, what's his name? Uh, oh, Mutt. Mutt. Yeah. Mixing in record one. I saw him, and he would work with Automated Fader, right? Yeah. He would sit there for a day <laughs> on a vocal. I've heard that, yeah. Getting every breath and everything exactly what once. And it's because when you think of what we do in Pro Tools now, how hard that is to do with a fader. Proof's in the pudding there. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would say <laughs> this, so. This thing sounds very controlled and... Very precise. <laughs> Everything's know? in its place, and of course, yeah. and, and having, you know, the end of a phrase could be everything emotionally to hear the tail of that phrase. Yeah, yeah. It's good and, to think about. And, and so, yeah, you can do things with the vocal that are pretty fabulous. Yeah. And now, with the higher sampling rates, I'm beginning to track at 192, right? And, because it's not really an issue anymore, right? You know, with 10, and and uh, it just sounds so much better. It's like, interesting. Say that you recorded. And this is the biggest problem we had when Pro Tools first came along. Say you're the original 16-bit lovely, you know, <laughs> Pro Tools at 44 yeah. or 48, and you're recording drums, and so you got C12s over the drums and whatever else. And maybe the drums aren't super bright, they're a little bit on the dark side, right? So you record it flat. Right. Right. Now you go and put two API, original API 558s, over the left side overheads, and you go plus 4, 12K shelf. What it sounds like once it's been recorded is utterly different than the way it sounds if I put those EQs across the mics. Before, yeah. Because with across the mics, you've got all this resolution that you're bringing up. Right. But once you record it at 16 bit 44 1, that's gone. Yeah. There's less resolution. <laughs> well, because on yeah. drums, particularly, the reason yeah. is because, because the peak information right. 
you have to record the overall level way lower than you would other instruments. Right. So all that information, the harmonics at 16K and 15K, is sitting down in a low bit range. Right, totally. So technically, if you patch your 550As across the mics when you record it, you're bringing all that stuff into a much higher res point as you're recording it. Right. So it makes the Pro Tools sound twice as good. Right. <laughs> and so that's been a problem with Pro Control as a system, or the way it's set up right now is because it's harder yeah. to get an analog equalizer before it hits Pro Tools. Right, right. It, because there's more and more visual work surfaces, and, and you, if you're especially being the mic P within that, you, it's just, they don't even have the cabling so that you could do it. Right, it's pretty crazy. There's a lot of impediments to good sound out there. <laughs> well, but, but when you get up to 192, yeah. then when you pass the EQ in, you start EQing, you start hearing stuff coming back. Right, right. And that was, and, and that, I think that's even more, no, it's, I mean, even between 96 and 192, I hear that even more. Right. But as I say, we switch gears yeah. to manufacturing, we make speakers, right. um, like we did the system for Ricky in here. Right. And um, we've always done systems for um, our clients, but it got into more now of a commercial audiophile stuff. Right. I was sitting with Rick Rubin in Munich, Germany, listening to audiophile speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Rick's total audio box. Yeah, yeah. Just checking different stuff out. Oh, he's totally into that. Yeah. That, that whole thing. And so we've been selling a lot of systems um, all over the country. We still we still do studio, you know, studio systems, but we do a lot of home hi fi. Really? That's what I was curious about that. Yeah. With with your original speakers way back in the day, was that also kind of an aim to both? It really was. It was more yeah. of a home hi fi thing originally. Yeah. But then, you know, when I helped Bill uh, do the original Yuri Timeline speaker, which right. is sort of a, an improved version 604. That was all based on him hearing my speakers and saying, I know we can make this better. Yeah. And there's a market for this. <laughs> right. And right. there was. He sold 10,000, thousands yeah. of these things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm not going to say it's the greatest speaker in the world, but it was significantly better than what was before. Right. And it was within a price range that was acceptable. Yeah. And then, then you know, like when Westlake came along, he had all these speakers that went loud, that they were harsh, and they, they decided most people. They, most big speakers and studios are fairly unlistenable. All they do is just go loud. A lot of the, yeah, exactly. They're the client impressors. Yeah, yeah. but they're not, they're not really even impressive. They're just yeah, loud. They're just loud, yeah. There's nothing high fidelity about it. They're good it. for bass overdubs. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Yeah, they, yeah like, you know, so we all sit and listen yeah. to small speakers because that's, yeah. Yeah, that's a real problem. Oh, yeah. And so my yeah. concept is I like big speakers to sound like, you know, I just like it to sound natural and right. be and I hate harsh I just like it so real what are the you've got a, like three different ranges or something or there's different more than that we have yeah. our oh, biggest right. system was like Dr. Dre has yeah um, you know you, you can get up to a million dollar speaker system each speaker's nine feet high and seven feet wide that's crazy oh yeah <laughs> I mean I guess someone comes out and installs it that, we that do the complete level. installations yeah we did one in Singapore we did one in Hong Kong yeah like that but we have uh, we have smaller speakers that are actually relatively Normal in size. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, are, that are, yeah. Because I, mean, I, I think some of the, like, a lot of the kids, you know, who sort of left the alternative rock scene and moved over to to more R&B, pop, and rap is because in their cars it sounded twice as good yeah. as the rock stuff did. Right. <laughs> the rock just sounded like garbage. Right. And it was no fun to listen to in the car. We were skipping between the, the hip-hop station and the alternative rock station in the car driving around yesterday. Yeah. And it would just you'd continually just go back to the hip hop because like, there's yeah. more space. Yeah, more it. space sounds so much yeah. better. Yeah, and also they didn't fill up every hole. Yeah, totally. Because the problem is with you know, press across the mix bus and doing five sets of, of stereo pairs of guitars, you filled every hole. Yeah. And every nuance, and there's no. <laughs> <laughs> What's left? Yeah. And so yeah. you know, so there's a number of mixers who became adept at that sort of thing. Yeah. And it got kind of pigeonholed as oh, it needs to sound like that. Yeah, definitely. And um, unfortunately, country music sort of moved in that direction as well. Yeah. And that was, <laughs> well, and, you know, there's always there's always little breaths of fresh air. There is. You know, you get like civil wars or something like that. And you're like, well, there's room in this music, you know. To actually hear some space. You know, and there's always people bubbling on, you know, all these like Gillian Welch records are just beautiful, you know. And isn't it great? When you, there's no reason. So there is some some, some fantastically always. hi-fi stuff. It's just, it's yeah. just it's the exception. And so... I um, I try hard to do that if I can. Yeah. <laughs> how did you approach? How, oh, you were collaborating with Sterling on that, I assume. Well, what happened is um, they approached me um, about maybe doing a mic. But the average guy sitting at his house who's got a little Pro Tools rig, a little mini rig, the most important thing that he needs is at least one or two good mics. 
So yeah. that in the end, you know, the vocals have to sound good, guitars have to sound good. So I said, well, if I come up with a microphone, that would be in the one thousand dollar range. Yeah. You know, that sounded as good as, and I, as a reference point, I say I was looking at like, I love the U forty seven Fet. You know, obviously, you know, the 47, the 67, the M49, these are great mics. When they made their first transistor mics, they didn't sound like, like you compare an um, 87 to a uh, 67, it didn't sound as good, but it still sounded good. It's a nice sounding yeah. mic. The new 87s don't sound anywhere near as good as the old 87s do. Yeah. Well, the same thing's true about a KM84, a KM184. The KM84 sounds much better. Right. Well, the first mics they made, particularly the U47 FAT, is a superb microphone. It doesn't sound like a 47. But it has good characteristics like a 47. It's a superb, I mean, Donald Fagan did fine on Nightfly, is the yeah. 47 Fet. That was yeah. it. And I, it's an excellent vocal microphone. And, um, but those on the used market are, still, are going for like 3800 bucks because they've become a classic in their own. Yeah. But, but the U47 Fet and the KM88 and the KM86 are my three favorite uh, transfer microphones. And then I wanted a microphone that sounded as good as the best 47 Fet, but maybe with a little a little different character, but something yeah. in that line. So I started, I took a listen to everything they had, and I didn't quite see anything that, that was exactly what I had in mind. So we started experimenting. And uh, it took me about almost two years to come up with what the finished version was. And so really it is along the lines of sounding like a, like a great 47 Fed. But also right. we didn't need two patterns because basically, you know, it's just a great, I want a great vocal mic, I want yeah. a great mic for acoustic guitars, great mic for acoustic bass, good mic for overhead drums. That's going to be cardioid most times. Yeah. yeah. So I, I want it, and I want to keep the price down where uh, it's only, you know, I want it to be $1,000 and not more than that. Yeah. And so I'm, we, that's, that's the niche we took and I think they sound really great. The other thing I found interesting is that, you know, I would try different configurations for the top and when I was buying all these U47s from Europe, and I probably had 400 U47s that I went through <laughs> conservatively. Yeah. And I listened, to, and I had electrostatic headphones, and I would sit and I'd listen to every mic. Yeah. I would compare every single microphone. And um, I noticed that the chrome tops seemed to have a little more air than the rest of the mics. I never right. quite figured that out. So I started comparing. And then I, 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 so I'd go through and I'd find the best capsules. And here's my, here, there was three versions of the 47, right? Right. And then there's even other versions depending on the capsules, but there's three main versions. Yeah. And so I would listen to them all and I'd get like, you know, eight nickels and I'd say, okay, this is, this, these are the two best ones right here. And then the chrome tops, these are the two best here. Yeah. So then I started changing tops and changing bodies and comparing capsules and seeing if electronics. Was, and what yeah. I found was that the chrome plated top added, it, it had more open, it was a more open sound than the nickel plated. Yeah. And it may be because at the at wavelengths at 16, 18 kilohertz, right. it makes a difference. They're those tiny, yeah. tiny it, it, And even the even the vibrations but go between the right. uh, the things. And it was right. it was open more open sound. Oh that's strange. So that was one, when we, we built that as one of the things that I incorporated yeah. in the design of this. And also it's impervious to overload. It will not distort. There's no oh, singer nice. in this around. So you can take any singer. Yeah. And I think that uh, as a pair of microphones, I don't know if anything that's gonna that'll touch it. Yeah. Just plug it in and away you go. There's less to think about. It's like the 160 compressor. Right. Give me three right. knobs. Um, with other products that you, we mentioned earlier, the UAD plug-in, the, the Ocean Away Room Sounds. Yeah, when Bill Putnam came to me, we were talk, we've were we been talking about this for quite some time. Yeah. About getting his father's two most famous rooms, yeah. you know, done. And there really hadn't been a way to capture that the way we wanted to do it. Right. We came up with a new way of measuring. Um, I've used this a bunch now, and yeah. the thing to me is like uh, I love convolution reverbs. Those can be those can be quite fun, you know, like just like the um, alto verb and stuff like that. Yeah. You can capture a, a tone of a space, but this isn't that. No, this is way beyond that. Yeah, <laughs> it requires. Well, first of all, it requires when you measure, you need speakers that go down to 18 hertz and go 20k and have super wide dispersion. Right. You can't put some little bookshelf in the room, put a BNK <laughs> microphone, and say, "Oh, there it is. That's not the room." Because yeah. it doesn't hit the room. Right. And so um, we make many measurements, not just one measurement. Yeah. And the, measure, the special, we have a program that coalesces the measurements that allows us to have infinite variabilities in the way we do it. Certain things I can't talk about because it's, you know, proprietary. And, sure. You know, but yeah. uh, the amount of resolution that we get is on a different planet than right. what you'd normally get in that kind of thing. And the other thing was is I said what I really want is I want the sound of the rooms, but I want the sound of the rooms the way I would actually record it. 
Right. So I want the sound of those mics. So we had eight sets of stereo pairs of microphones in three positions in the room in right. front of each source. And so I wanted to be able to, even for me as an engineer, I could never put up that many microphones, balance them and set the time. It would take me a day, and it did. <laughs> well, yeah, it did. <laughs> just to set them up. I yeah. mean, it made like eight hours of work just to set the microphones up in place and then move right. them all again. And so yeah. I find myself yeah. calling up the program, right, going, okay, hey, all right, this is the 50s here. Maybe yeah. a little over here. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. And, and it's, it's easier. It's so much easier than me yeah. actually doing it. I mean, Billy and I, when we were assembling the finished version, we were listening to every single pair of microphones, right? And we have infinite amount of variables in each one, things that we can adjust right. that, that you don't see, but there are ways we can do it, which is all the various management we've made. And so we'd listen to each pair of microphones, and if we didn't think it was dramatic enough, we might take more of a, of a different way that we had done it to make it sound more interesting. Right. So that when you went to each one, I wanted each one to be unique and have its own thing. Right. And so that Billy and I sense. spent weeks yeah. listening to all of it to come up with wow. the preset that you hear. Yeah, it, it feels like that, you know. I mean, it's the thing that I really like, and I, I try to teach this to people a lot of times. Is, you know, there's left, right, and there's high and low, and there's but front and back is a very important part of recording, and a lot of times people don't record with that intent. Yeah, you know, their tracking might just be close mic, close mic, close mic, close exactly. mic, close mic, and you know, like, as you know, like maybe you've got a backing vocals that are hogging the vo front right. lead vocal. You see, somehow move it. Back a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah. I've done it with one of the best things I've used uh, you know, that program for is like for, say, a piano mm -hmm. track to push it back in the room behind the behind the drums and the instruments to just feel kind of like they're just behind the singer somewhere. If you, if, you, if you have the wherewithal, you can create a feel. Yeah. Like even if you had like two acoustic guitars that were recorded close mic, right? Right. Okay, now you put them up left and right. And then you print a stem for each one. Right, that puts them in a space where that you swear to God they're standing <laughs> in the room, yeah. right there, right, and right, right there. Right. I mean, I, I still record almost everything in stereo, and right. I don't use pan pots if I can avoid it. I just put them where I want them. Right. Bruce Woody and classic. <laughs> yeah. I want them left center. Yeah. Uh, left center. <laughs> the sense of fantasy he always talks about, right? Oh yeah, and it makes yeah. it sound so. Uh, it sounds it's, it's so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's tangible. Well, it's fun talking to you because you're actually, you go through all this stuff. You know, this has been the good thing about doing this magazine, you know, was, was I started this nearly 20 years ago because I wanted to learn more. Oh, yeah. So the whole process of, for me has been assembling like a very nice studio along the way of interviewing everybody and learning, right? <laughs> well, you know, as you know, since years, you know, I mean, sometimes it's fun. I mean, I used to go into really difficult environments where, where nothing, they don't have any good mics, nothing's really good. Yeah. And still making it work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because you, you have a concept, there are things you can do. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and more of it is the engineering chops and the musical chops than it is, you know, I mean, equipment's important, but it's not the most important thing. Thanks for listening. Find us online at tapeop.com, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time.